Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have the Tichborne case. This was quite a bizarre legal case that captivated Victorian England in the 1860s and 1870s. It involved a claimant named Arthur Orton, who alleged that he was the long lost heir to the Tichborne baronetcy. Despite numerous inconsistencies in his story, Arthur managed to convince some members of the Tichborne family and a significant portion of the public that he was who he claimed to be. The case went to trial in 1873 and it became a media sensation with thousands of people lining up outside the courthouse to catch a glimpse of the proceedings. This was basically like the Victorian era's OJ trial or the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial, you know? The people wanted to know. Despite Arthur's conviction for perjury, the case continued to fascinate the public for years to come and it became a symbol of the era's fascination with sensationalism and fraud. The Tichborne case remains one of the most infamous legal cases in British history and is a cautionary tale about the dangers of believing in something without sufficient evidence. In our number 9 spot today, we have the London Beer Flood. This sounds like it would be quite a fun time, but it was anything but that and instead was a tragic event that occurred on October 17th, 1814 in the St. Giles District of London. At the Mew and Company Brewery, a massive vat containing over 135,000 gallons of beer suddenly ruptured, causing a wave of beer to flood the surrounding streets. The torrent of beer destroyed several nearby houses, killing eight people and injuring many others. The flood was so powerful that it even knocked down the wall of a nearby pub, trapping and killing some of the patrons inside. The London beer flood was caused by a combination of factors, including poor construction of the vat and overfilling it with beer. The brewery had a history of safety concerns and many of the workers were aware of the dangers associated with working there. Despite this, the brewery continued to operate and tragedy struck. The incident it became the subject of much media attention at the time, and it continues to be remembered today as a tragic and bizarre event in London's history. The victims of the flood were commemorated with a plaque on the site of the former brewery, and the incident has been the subject of numerous articles, books, and even a stage play. Not sure the logistics of that one though. In our number eight spot today, we have the Victorian bicycle craze. This is a name to refer to a period of intense enthusiasm for bicycles that swept across Europe and North America in the late 19th century. The introduction of the safety bicycle with its chain driven mechanism and rubber tires made cycling a much more accessible activity for the general public. It became a popular mode of transportation and leisure activity, particularly among the middle and upper classes. The craze also had a significant impact on fashion, with women's clothing becoming more practical and comfortable to allow for cycling. It's funny to think of now because like, it's just a bike, but at the time it was so much more than that. It's like how smartphones completely changed our lives in more ways than we probably even know. That's basically what the bike was like in the Victorian era. The bicycle craze had a profound impact on society and culture at the time. It led to the development of new industries, such as cycling clubs, and it also paved the way for the modern transportation industry. The bicycle became a symbol of freedom and empowerment, particularly for women who were able to travel further and faster than ever before. The Victorian bicycle craze remains an important cultural and historical phenomenon that changed the way people lived, worked, and played. Number seven, toilet troubles. Now, the Victorian era was unsanitary, to say the least, but it was also dangerous in ways that you wouldn't expect, right? Go to the bathroom and may not come out. One of the greatest Victorian inventions was that of the bathroom, but it took a few tries to figure out the whole, you know, methane gas problem. We gotta really deal with that one first and foremost. Spontaneous combustion of the bathroom was weirdly common. This would, uh, this is every time you take a shit, you were worried that you might just Woo! That was horrible, that's so scary. Flammable gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide, they would build up over time with human waste. Human, a, a, a lot of human waste. Built up in the sewers and then eventually would back up into your homes. Next thing you know, you're lighting a candle and your bathroom's gone. Just like that. Now we have poo-pourri. You know what that is? You ever see a little spray after you go, you just, you hide what you've done with one little spray at your friend's house. It's fascinating how far we've come. In our number six spot today, we have the East End Outbreak. The East End Outbreak was an outbreak of cholera in 1866 and was a major epidemic that struck the densely populated area of East London, causing widespread illness and death. Cholera is a highly contagious disease that spreads through contaminated water, and in the Victorian era, London's water supply was notoriously unsanitary. The outbreak was particularly devastating in the East End 
weekend, where poverty and overcrowding made residents more vulnerable to disease. The outbreak led to significant changes in public health policy and infrastructure, as well as increased public awareness of the importance of sanitation and hygiene. The physician Jon Snow, which, you know, feels like a weird name to say when I'm not talking about Game of Thrones, but the physician Jon Snow played a key role in identifying the source of the outbreak, tracing it to a contaminated water pump on Broad Street. His work really paved the way for the development of modern epidemiology and disease prevention. The East End cholera outbreak remains a significant event in the history of public health and the struggle for social justice. It brought attention to the urgent need for clean water and adequate sanitation, and it helped to spur reforms that improved the health and well-being of people in urban areas. Number 5. Dress is too big. This is something I'm glad isn't a thing anymore. I, I'm not a person who likes to dress up. I'm a simple dude. Casual and comfortable is my forte. However, uncomfortable wearing suits is. I like to think I clean up well. And I understand sometimes you gotta wear drip. It's just how life goes. Sometimes you gotta dress up. I just don't think people should be showing up to any formal events in cowboy boots and a pop collar shirt. I've known a few of those people. But what I'm really talking about here is the obtuse size of women's dresses and just the whole culture of women's fashion back then. It's just crazy. Large and overbearing dresses with enough material to use as blankets when you sleep. I know that couldn't have been fun. It just, it's horrible. Especially with my sweat problem. A few hours in a suit and maybe a few beers later and the first thing I'm trying to do is take the suit off. It gets tight and sweaty in there and it's just a lot of material. It's just, it's just too much. Too much. And doorways, trying to get through doorways. Ugh. Forget about it. In our number four spot today, we have the Great Stink of London. The Great Stink of London was an environmental disaster that occurred in the summer of 1858. It was caused by the city's inadequate sewage system, which allowed raw sewage and waste to be dumped directly into the River Thames. The hot weather only exacerbated the problem, which is disgusting, and it caused the sewage to ferment and emit a foul odor that permeated the city. The smell was so overwhelming that it caused widespread illness and forced many people to flee the city. Parliament was forced to act, and a major engineering project was launched to build a modern sewage system for London. This project was led by engineer Joseph Bazalget, who designed a system of sewers and pumping stations that would carry sewage out of the city and into the Thames estuary. The construction of the new sewage system was a massive undertaking, involving the excavation of miles of tunnels and the construction of large pumping stations. It took several years to complete, but once it was finished, it greatly improved the health and hygiene of the city. The Great Stink was a turning point in the history of public health, and it helped to spur major improvements in sanitation and public health infrastructure across the developed world. Today, the legacy of the Great Stink lives on in the modern sewer systems and wastewater treatment facilities that are really essential for maintaining public health and environmental quality. Number three, the Kensington system. Poor Queen Victoria. I know this is kind of a stretch, but it relates back to the whole mistreating women thing. But basically, it was something implemented in order to control the young royal, make her dependent on her mother, whom she was not allowed to be without. Basically, modern day strict parents. Now, all the kids watching right now, or all the kids who've grown up, how well did that parenting work? Let us know in the comments. I'm willing to bet it created a little bit of a divide between parent and child, am I right? That's exactly what happened with Queen Victoria. Shouldn't be surprised, really. Being a parent is tough. I get that, but squeeze too hard and the sand falls through the cracks of your hand. Victoria wasn't even allowed an hour to herself, and I don't care who you are, no matter how charismatic or bubbly. Everybody needs some alone time. In our number two spot today, we have the Birmingham Riots. These riots took place in 1839, and they were a series of violent clashes that occurred in the city of Birmingham, England. The riots were sparked by tensions between two groups. The Chartists, who were calling for political reform and greater democratic representation, and the authorities who opposed the movement. On July 4th, 1839, a group of Chartists held a rally in Birmingham's Bull Ring, where they were met with opposition from local government agencies. The situation quickly escalated into violence with protesters and authorities engaging in brutal clashes that lasted for several days. The Birmingham riots of 1839 were significant for their role in the history of the Chartist movement, and it is said that the events of 1839 demonstrated the lengths to which authorities were willing to go to suppress the movement. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the Brown Dog Affair. This was a controversy that arose in the early 20th century in London over the use of animals in medical 
research. In 1903, a statue of a brown dog was erected in Battersea, which had been used in vivisection experiments by a scientist named William Bayless. If you're unfamiliar, vivisection is defined as, quote, the practice of performing operations on live animals for the purpose of experimentation or scientific research. While I am all for the advancement of science, I do believe in ethical studies, and this clearly was not that. The statue was intended as a memorial to the countless animals that had been used in medical research, but it was met with outrage from some people. Anti-vivisection groups saw it as a symbol of animal cruelty, while some medical researchers saw it as an attack on their work. In 1907, a group of medical students attacked the statue during a protest, sparking a violent confrontation with anti-vivisection activists. The statue was eventually removed by authorities, but the controversy continued to rage on for many years. The brown dog affair highlighted the deep divisions in society over the use of animals in medical research and contributed to the development of new laws and regulations aimed at protecting animal welfare. Number 10, mudlarks. Victorian London, around the 1840s, it was a bit of a mess. Yeah, a lot of sore throats, that's for sure. Everybody was sick all the time and the jobs that were available certainly did not help the cause. The jobs that were available had you catching rats and crawling into sewers. One of the worst jobs to have was that of a mudlark. As their name hints towards, a mudlark involved getting in deep in the muck that builds up alongside the Thames River. This one was reserved for younger folks, obviously, because it was like working in quicksand. If you were older, you would just get trapped. It was pretty sad. It was also exhausting, not to mention the chances of being washed away by the river were pretty high. All for the slim chance of finding a pocket watch, driftwood, rags, anything really worth your troubles. Number nine, chimney sweep. I remember when I was younger, I had to sweep the chimney in the house every now and then, whatever, and I personally, I loved it, you know? I thought I was the father of the house for a bit, getting in the chimney, getting all dirty and stuff, doing this, my hands on my, on my waist, I don't know, it's, that's, that's what a man was when I was younger. That little broom too, I love that little broom. I remember when I would do this, my grandmother, who is very English, she would be shook. She would watch the entire time. She would be taken back into time because this was a terrible job to have in Victorian London. I was, yeah, it was not the same at all. Chimney sweeps were famously young. I can't say anything else there in regards, but yeah, they were, we lads, to say the least. History is horrible. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because a law was passed that then made it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and then clean a chimney. Thank, thank God, I'm glad that stopped. I was 18 cleaning my chimney. I had no idea I could have used this great law. Been like, actually, mother, a lot of claws. Number eight, funeral mute. Funerals suck, man. I was a pallbearer like three times before the age of 21. My one arm is just strong as fuck now, that's it. I can lift anything just with one arm. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, right? Victorian London saw many, many funeral mutes. Oliver Twist, one of those lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. Funeral mutes were required to dress in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would essentially be to stand and mourn silently at the door of the recently deceased home. Yeah, guy dies of a plague and you're like standing there like holding your breath like great, this is the worst job ever. You would then lead the coffin to the graveyard. So a lot of responsibility. Yeah, don't trip or breathe. In our number seven spot today, we have the Crimean War. The Crimean War was a conflict fought between 1853 and 1856, primarily involving Russia and an alliance of France Britain, the Ottoman Empire, and Sardinia. The war was fought over various territorial and religious disputes, particularly regarding the rights of Christians in the Ottoman Empire. The war was marked by high casualties, particularly from disease and poor medical care, and it is often seen as a turning point in military medicine. The war also featured some of the first extensive use of modern technologies, such as telegraphs and railways, which greatly impacted warfare in the future. The war ended in a victory for the Allied forces, and it resulted in a significant shakeup of the balance of power in Europe. It also demonstrated the need for improved communication, organization, and medical care in military conflicts, and it had significant long-term impacts on military and political strategies in Europe and beyond. Number six, stairs. Yeah, believe it or not, stairs were a common danger in Victorian times. I'm somebody personally who falls up and down stairs a lot. 
I'm 6'2", I'm lanky as shit. I have like a Gumby body. I walk around like Woody. I'm always falling up and down stuff. It's horrible, especially in Canada. It's so slippery. I'm always, always slipping all the time. In Victorian times, I would have been doomed. Houses were thrown up comedically fast. There wasn't a Mike Holmes on Holmes to come in and check it out. There wasn't a building inspector that made things, you know, safe. Servant staircases, they were tiny. They were out of sight. They were built into these narrow walls, often missing steps that they had to and cut corners just to, you know, be narrow and out of the way. That plus a tray of hot soup and a lot of clothing, yeah, it was next to impossible to move around without something happening. A lot of fatalities in staircases. Even today, around 12,000 people die each year falling downstairs. Hold on to that railing. I'm here to remind you to hold on to that railing. It's crazy. There's actually no stairs there. I just made that whole thing up. Hit that like button for magic. Number five big polluter. This just doesn't make any sense. It never did to me. And it still doesn't. But in case you didn't know, self-pleasure was a big no-no. Commonly called self-pollution, which honestly is very funny to me. That's just hilarious. Don't self-pollute yourself, Chris. That's bad. Don't do that. That's naughty. It was a sin and thought to be a cause for many ailments. I'm sure you've heard the classic saying that for guys, if you decided to go bump in the night by yourself, there's a good chance you'd need a walking stick because it would make you go blind. Women were also targeted, however, as for any pearl polishing by women was thought to be hysteric and needed to be treated for such. Look, the truth is, any man who wants to wax his carrot or woman tuning a one dial radio should be able to do so without judgment of society or medical remedies of snake oil doctors. Love yourself, love everybody else, and just, as long as the bedroom door's closed, you're good. Just, just don't do it in public, you're good. Number four, bird hats. Look, I don't have much to say about this next one here, because, well, all right, yeah. I love a good hat. I've worn a few hats here throughout my time on Bumblebee, some baseball caps, some beanies here and there, sure. I've never worn a dead bird on my hat though, and I don't think that I will. That's for certain, I might just leave that out. Taxidermy was a hot topic back in Victorian London. Folks would rock the dead beaver bowler hat, any animal they would just prop up there, and it was considered fashion at the time, believe it or not. It was a dangerous trend though, long term. Conservationists were saying that 67,000 species of birds were all at risk of extinction due to this crazy dead bird hat craze. Can you imagine just a stuffed seagull on my hat? I'm like, all right, number five, here we go. It's crazy. Also, that's like a lot of weight, you know what I mean? A lot of weight on your head, just kind of, oh sorry, there's just a dead pigeon on my head, so my neck's kind of sore. What if the wings opened up and you kind of just like got some air? Maybe that's why they did it. Number three, hot Christmas. This is just so dumb. I'm just gonna go ahead and tell everyone at home right now not to do this, because I know some of you, and some of you are gonna be like, oh, thanks, Chetty, that's cool. No, don't do it. I'm a doctor, a lawyer, and a firefighter. Basically, this was a super fun game that felt like something out of Johnny Knoxville's head, not Victorian families gathering at Christmas. Basically, they would gather at Christmas to play a game called Snapdragon. You get a bowl of raisins and almonds, you pour some brandy in there, and maybe one out for your homie, and ignite the brandy. Once the bowl is on fire, the family will compete to see who can grab the flaming treats and eat them the fastest. Okay, second degree burns are not how I want to spend my holiday season, and also, in a time before smoke alarms and a modern fire service, this sounds like a really bad time. Grandpa could lose it out of his hands. Drapes catch fire, the house burns down, probably the whole neighborhood. Just a bad idea. Also, I hate raisins, so setting them on fire? Yeah, I'm out. I don't like raisins. They're gross, dude. I don't like them. Number two, lots of arsenic. We of course have to mention a big problem in the 1800s. Arsenic, everywhere, all at once, okay? Skin lotion, tons of cosmetics, it was a nightmare. Even if you didn't use any facial cream or anything, it was everywhere else. It was in wallpaper, it was in dresses, it was in toys, medicine. My gosh, it really was horrible, it's a nightmare. And it's because arsenic was cheap at the time. It was during the Industrial Revolution. It was being unearthed more and more, and finally, come 1851, the Arsenic Act was passed past which fixed a lot of issues. Yeah, we regulated that one not soon enough, but we definitely got that one fast. And finally, number one, Jack the Ripper. Unidentified to this day, we've got to end on a horrific note. Everybody's just finding out now about Jeffrey Dahmer, it seems. He's a hot topic on Netflix. But what about Jack the Ripper? How did he get away with it this entire time? Why aren't we going to see a Netflix doc on him? ever. Jack the Ripper was active in the East London neighborhoods, primarily targeting 
sex workers in the area. Now, at the time, the murders of five women from August to November of 1888 were believed to have been connected somehow to Jack the Ripper, although some sources claim that he was active even until 1891. Again, we're never gonna know at this point. Many believe Jack the Ripper had some anatomical knowledge due to the way that he left his victims. I can't really say anything else because it's disgusting, but yeah, he knew some things, disgustingly. And while there were some suspects, including a member of the British royal family, believe it or not, Jack the Ripper was still never identified. Number 10, bottomless undies. I think I speak for everyone when I say that putting on a clean, fresh pair of underwear is a nice feeling. Gone is the brown underwear that was once white of yesterday, replaced with fresh loving linen of today. Now, if you're also like me, then you probably have some underwear with holes in it. I'll throw them out eventually, I'll, I'll get around to it, just I'll wear them a few more times first and then I'll get rid of them. But did you know that some ladies underwear in the Victorian era had no bottoms? Yeah. Part of the many layers of clothing that women were wearing back then, their underwear had no bottoms, which to me is the whole point of wearing bloomers in the first place. You gotta keep your business warm and packed away. I just don't understand what the point of having it all hang out is. That's just, that's just stupid. I don't know. Number nine, no razors. There's a joke about the 70s, George W. Bush and garden hedges here, but I'm gonna let you fill in the blanks. Basically, this is a time in history where you cannot hop in the whip and drive on over to your local hair razor dealership because there ain't no whips and there ain't no CVS. Or Shoppers Drug Mart if you're Canadian. Today you can buy disposable razors pretty much anywhere and there's multiple models for doing so. When things get hairy, you got options. Women in the Victorian era were not so lucky. They had to go for the natural look. Now, not that there's anything wrong with that, it's just, I feel like a girl's gotta have her options. She gotta be able to, you know, do her own thing. Why not? Number eight. The Dirty Thames. When you think of Victorian England and the people, there's only really two classes. The wealthy and the ones who are broke and sound like they're from Peaky Blinders, love. Yeah, that's right. However, even for women of high esteem with their bottomless undies and lady mains growing a flush, the streets of Victorian London weren't very bourgeois, to say the least. Muddy dirt roads, thieves, beggars, and a really bad smell. It just didn't smell very nice. Oh, and also a really scary guy, but we'll get to that in part one. But perhaps the most disgusting was the Thames River, which after years of treating it the same way Brendan Fraser was treated after the Mummy franchise was over, it wasn't a good look. It was full of filth, sewage, garbage, and animal cadavers. So much so that it was said you could walk across the river on top of them. That is no place for a lady to be. Oof. Number seven, a good thing. If I'm talking about medieval times, there's a good chance I'm gonna bring up the super not cool, not fun, do not condone or support the behavior of marrying a woman at the age of 12. Yucky. In part one, I mentioned that there was a ton of corners and streets being worked by the only other job besides street cleaners at 3 a.m. by women. However, after venereal disease was becoming a serious issue, it was getting pretty bad. It was becoming clear that a lot of people who were getting sick were young women. Like, 11 to 16 age group, oof. Which I shouldn't have to tell you is bad. That, that's pretty bad, dude. When I was 16, I was rocking Black Ops 2, hanging out with my buddies and partying hard in the summer. I got a lot of good stories. Maybe I'll share them one day. Catching all that nasty stuff is no way to spend your youth. So thank God the government changed the age of consent to 16 years old, which I know is not a solution for everything that was going on, but it was a small step forward in the right direction. That's what we like. Good history moving forward. We like that. Chetty likes. Number six, hand cleavage. This goes for every inch of the skin, really, but women had to cover up back then. That means no ankles, neck, or God forbid a wrist. If a man saw a wrist, they would act, uh, ooh. Well, I don't know if they were that down bad, but women of higher esteem wore gloves. There's, there's etiquette to gloves. It was all part of the, the culture, which means only women with dosh could practice such glove etiquette. I say no woman should have the cover up. She should wear whatever the heck she wants when the heck she wants to. However, with the gloves, I believe there's a separate issue. I have an issue being a big dude with asthma. I sweat a lot more than the average folk. It just sucks, but if I was a fair lady with those gloves on, well, I might want to leave them on. Wouldn't want to ruin anyone's appetites for kaffir appetizers because the smell and the sweat, it just, 
Ooh, be gross. Ooh. In our number five spot today, we have the London Burgers. This is the name used to refer to a notorious of body snatchers who operated in London in the early 19th century. They were involved in the illegal trade of selling corpses to medical schools for dissection and study, and they would often resort to killings to obtain the bodies. The most infamous member of the gang was William Burke, who, along with his partner William Hare, committed a series of killings in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1828. They sold the corpses to the anatomist Robert Knox, who was unaware of their methods. Two of the group's members, John Bishop and Tom Miss Williams were convicted of killings and sentenced to death. The London Burger scandal highlighted the demand for fresh corpses for medical research and contributed to the passage of the Anatomy Act of 1832, which allowed for the legal procurement of corpses for medical purposes. Emphasis on the legal part of that, though. It's important. Number four, fava beans. Well, after all that sweating and being around all that foulness, ladies needed to detox. How about a nice face mask made of beef? Yes, that's right. To keep their skin young and beautiful, they would drape a slice of beef over their face. Nothing like a little Hannibal Lecter before bedtime. Now, I hear you saying, well, Chad, that's not that bad. Okay, but think about this though. For the time period, that beef was probably yucky due to food processing practices of the time, and, and there's just no fridges. That means it was stinky. I hope it was at least winter before these ladies decided to beef up like that. This process of beef was supposed to rejuvenate the skin because beef contains some important vitamins for such. I just, I can't recommend that. You just walk in with the beef and, hello darling, yeah. Ugh, gross. Number three, holiday cards. Today, these Hallmark holiday cards, they go way too hard. And they also have a card for everyone and everything, you name it. Birthdays, weddings, stepdad's name day, you're like, what? That's so specific. Like, they have everything covered. But back in the 1800s, these holiday cards, they were brand new. Nobody knew what to write or say, so they would just end up sending these artistic, sentimental scenes. It would be like a frog in a top hat riding a bike. No caption, just that. You'd be like, hey, Merry Christmas, I guess. It'd be like like a carrot with a face. It'd be a haunting image, really, to receive from a loved one on Christmas, but it's the thought that counts, I guess. This holiday season, just give your parents a card with this on it, and then see what they do. Don't even write anything, just stare at them in the corner, all Victorian-like, and be like, mother, father, Merry Fortnight Christmas. I don't know what they would say. Number two, crypt picks. Look, it's a part of life. It happens. You live, you love, and depending on how much your wife likes interior design, you probably have a sign hanging up like that in your home somewhere that says something like that. You know what I'm talking about. And after spending all that time in home sense, it's all over. Fade the black, cease to exist, the forever box. There's a whole process and respect in the undertaking business. The Victorian era had a strange tradition, however. How about taking photographs with the body of a family member who has recently passed on? Yeah, that's right, I know. I couldn't believe it, really. People would sit there for minutes taking photos of those who are no longer with us because the process of taking photos was not great. This isn't the digital age, after all. This is something that the Crypt Keeper would make you do. Keep, just, and, and keep them in the album or something. Just, just not, not for your everyday family, man. That's just weird. Yeah, so now we're going to take photos. <laughs> yeah, like that's just weird, you know what I mean? It's just weird, it's weird. Number one, Jack the Ripper. Listen, the women of Victorian London feared this guy, and how can you blame them? A terror that seemed to come from nowhere and could strike from anywhere. Humans unaliving other humans is nothing new, and it probably won't be old, it won't get old soon. We, we're, this is what we do, it's kind of our thing. But this was the first modern serial unaliver. Jack the Ripper's identity has never been found. It's only been speculated, and some studies suggest that it has been revealed, but it's really hard to pinpoint something that happened that long ago. He was nasty, and the crimes were awful. The photographs of the crime scene do not exactly follow today's media rules or decency, as it's really just horrible, and it's just really messy and bloody and just gross. It's kind of hard to talk about this era without Jack the Ripper. Women should feel safe at night no matter what era it is. That's right, ladies, I'm on your side. Number 10, no calling, no gifts. This is a time in history when men were told to be gentlemen and women told to be ladies. Naturally, that came with some weird social practices. For instance, women were discouraged from accepting gifts from men. Personally, I like to give my girlfriend flowers and chocolate. I'm a classic guy, what can I say? Can't go wrong with that. 
However, even if a handsome silver tongued devil such as myself were to give some flowers and the finest dark chocolate a 7 Eleven has to offer, and a most promising woman were to accept said gifts, she may not be able to call me back. Literally, because well, the phone isn't exactly a thing yet, and also because that's something else women were just discouraged from doing. <sighs> call on a man? <sighs> no way, Jose! Even if he is super nice and waiting for a genuine response. One etiquette guidebook from 1882 called any woman who calls on a man ill-bred and positively improper to do so. I like when people give me flowers and chocolate. Maybe call me sometimes, I'm a little lonely. Number 9. Act like a lady. How dare ladies do anything unladylike? Ugh, said every man ever in the Victorian era. This is a time in history when ladies gotta be ladylike. That means makeup, corsets, and, and don't you dare do anything masculine. Oh, that's me angry. This is still a time when food isn't the greatest either, so imagine if you got an upset tummy at the dinner table. Happens to me a lot. You've got a handsome prince that your parents have arranged for you to marry. When you go to greet him, you do it with a simple gesture as kneeling to curtsy could turn your linens a certain shade of embarrassment that 1800 stain cleaning technology could never wash away. You'd poop yourself. Where's Billy Mays when you need him, right? How dare a woman do such things as go number two, or even worse, break wind. Oh, the nerve. That's just the way it went, folks. I don't make the rules. Number eight, charged with love. Naturally, this was the past, and not being open to homosexuality was just the way it was. Especially when tucking yourself into bed at night alone wasn't allowed either. Homosexuality just wasn't gonna happen. They, they just weren't gonna be approved of it. It's just how it goes. It sucks. However, it's almost as if there's been love on this earth since day one, and to stop that kind of love, it's just silly, man. Wherever I go, everyone is welcome on this channel or my Twitch. Chetty loves everyone because in reality, this is a time period where you could wind up in jail for that kind of love. And as Awesome Powers would say, that's just not very groovy, baby. Yeah. Strangely enough, homosexual relationships between women might have been completely overlooked as they were sometimes mistaken for women being friends. Yeah, I know. Some women even lived together. But given that they probably needed each other for financial support, people just kind of thought that's how it went and they ignored it. It's like they live together and you start putting the pieces together and it's like, you know, they, I don't know, something weird going on there. But love everybody, come on, be nice. Number seven. Calf ear appetizers. This one goes out to all the folks who like their steak well done, as this may be too much to stomach. Given the way food was prepped and handled back then, I would agree with most folks that cooking the devil out of your meat was probably just the safer bet. Sucks for me because I like my steak rare, as rare as you can make it. Blue, almost, honestly. I, I love it like that. I am also willing to bet that most of you folks who like your steak well done aren't a big fan of fat and gristle. <laughs> I also love fat and grizzle. I just like meat, what can I say? What I'm getting to is calf ear appetizers. Yes, cooked calf ears, which I'm pretty sure are just like pure cartilage. Higher class women could often find themselves at parties where they would serve up this chewy delight. You'd probably just be chewing on that for a while. I feel like most people wouldn't like that. Is Chris a cartilage guy? I don't know, we'll see. Number six, the seam seamstress. Being that the industrial revolution had started and business was booming, People needed to travel for business, or more specifically, men needed to travel for business, which means they gotta be away from their wives, and that means they are away from the very thing we're talking about today. Bedroom stuff. How did men solve this issue? Well, there was no shortage of ladies roaming street corners to uh, aid in, in that matter. However, there's an option with a little less syphilis. There were AIDS or early blow up dolls called travel ladies. Strangely enough, it was stored in a gentleman's hat. What? That's so wrong. Once it was ready to be used, it was inflated and reassembled. This is a quote from an ad from one of the products. It is inflated to the essential part of the woman wanted by a man. That just, that just doesn't sound very good. This is why we have boards of people to check stuff from products before it gets shipped out to the public. I feel like that just wouldn't fly very well today. Number five. Burke and Hare. Medical schools were offering a handsome fee for deceased bodies to study. This was this is an odd time. So an unhealthy amount of Victorians came up with this new solution. They thought they were brilliant. Yeah, they would rob graves. They would just go and rob the freshest graves they could find. They would wait in the bushes until the funeral's over and then they would go and 
disgusting. It got so out of hand that family members were actually guarding the graves of recently deceased overnight. That's how bad it got, that's disgusting. But nobody goes down in history like William Burke and William Hare. They were an unlikely duo, to say the least. They wouldn't wait until the body was done living. You know what I mean? They would actually kill people and rush the process, all for a pretty penny. 16 victims in total between 1827 and 1828. It took 16 victims for people to start catching on to this weird plan. The pair would lure victims into their house, fill them with alcohol, and then they would suffocate them. They had a sick system and they would suffocate them because the body needed to be in the best condition possible in order to receive a payout from the Edinburgh University Medical School. So they would you know, try and keep it as clean as possible, which is horrible to say, but it makes sense. The Anatomy Act in 1832 put an end to this horrific plan. Good. Number four, shake and bake. I'm something of a scientist myself, but that doesn't mean I know everything. And if you actually need to learn something about health and safety, take it from a professional, not a second rate John Candy. However, when coming across this fact, I just had to share it because with my medical knowledge, this just doesn't sound right. All right, so kids, we know how they're made. I don't need to go into detail for that. However, there was this idea back in the Victorian days that if a woman danced shortly after doing what mommy and daddies do, then there was a chance that her pregnancy just wouldn't happen. Or perhaps more commonly after riding a horse. S same idea, uh, okay. Which is frankly, horse. I mean, come on, my mom always told me when she was baking that I had to be quiet and stop running around the house or the cake she was baking wouldn't rise. Well, they always did, and I love chocolate cake. I mean, really, I do. I'm starting to wonder if there's a connection here. I was a rowdy kid. In our number three spot today, we have Typhoid Mary. The Typhoid Mary case is a famous incident in the history of public health in the United States. Mary Mallon, also known as Typhoid Mary, was an asymptomatic carrier of the bacteria that causes typhoid fever, a potentially fatal disease. Despite being unaware of her condition, Mary inadvertently infected numerous people during her work as a cook in New York City in the early 1900s. After a number of typhoid outbreaks were traced back to Mary's cooking, she was tracked down and forcibly quarantined for several years. The case generated significant controversy at the time, with some arguing that Mary's civil rights had been violated and others maintaining that public safety justified her isolation. The Typhoid Mary case remains significant for its implications for public health policy and for the balance between individual rights and public safety. Number two, a healthy breakfast. Okay, not Victorian London, but this is just too funny not to mention, and it's around the same time period, very close. As the great minds of the time thought, self-pollution was a big no-no, and the reason for these urges was often related to food. Some thought eating meat would make you down bad, so a man named John Harvey Kellogg, you might have heard of him, aimed to cure the sickness of self-love. What if a man had a delicious, nutritious meal to eat, especially at the start of his day? Cornflakes! by Kellogg's, the, the very same cereal that's probably sitting on top of your fridge, yeah, was partially originally designed to stop you from feeling those carnal urges. Now, not sure if that works. I mean, go ahead and tell me how you feel after eating a bowl of that. I had one this morning. I feel fine. I don't feel any different at all. I mean, I'm just, well, not really feeling the same about Pam Anderson anymore, though. Number one, rising action. This could get some married couples into some trouble if they're watching. So sorry. It's gonna be hard to talk about this without saying it because YouTube will send a stern letter if I do, but here it goes. The deed was not considered done unless both parties had signed off on it, uh, had their toes curled, reaching the peak, your magnum opus, the way I feel when I eat at McDonald's, DEFCON 1, or simply mispronouncing organisms in health class. I feel like once you're involved, you're involved. And to me, that's a done deal. You can't really reverse it from that point on, regardless of any of my euphemisms, but that's what they thought. They thought if you didn't, you both didn't climb that mountain together, it didn't happen. Cause science. Number 10, train engine cleaner. Ever wanted to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out the coal that was left in there? Ever wanted to go underneath a train where you can't fully stand up in the middle of the night and rake out a dusty ash pan, getting all kinds of ash and stuff in your mouth? Perfect. 
you can go join up with the railroad as a train engine cleaner. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains, and then spend their nights climbing into said furnace, cleaning it out, and then going out in the middle of the freezing cold, wet night into a trench covered in water and oil and dust, and get right up under that sucker and pull out all the ashes and dust and crap that came out of the engine while it had been running all day. Number 9. Linker Boy or Linker Men Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, the only gas lighting came in the form of small children who made you believe that you wouldn't be able to walk the streets without them tagging along with a torch to help guide your way. Then they'd expect a tip from you. Oh, rascals. They weren't so bad. They were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to point B while being able to see one foot in front of the other. And their charge was usually just one farthing, or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker boy, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from the time, and there were even some rather infamous ones, like Lawrence Casey, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Oi! Where you going mate? You forgot to like and subscribe to the channel. Oh, and while I've got your attention, why not take a little peek over at our Facebook, where you'll find behind the scenes content. Get on with it! Alright, alright, bloody hell, bloody hell. Number 8. Knock her up. No, not like that. God. Look. I despise my alarm clock. It wakes me out of my deeply deserved beauty sleep at 6 a.m. every weekday morning. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real person. That person is a knocker up, a person employed to wake up workers at mills and factories on early shifts, going from house to house using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows. In other words, a person employed to become the epitome of all my hatred in this world. If you had this job, well, you're not alive anymore, but I hate you. The people at the time were somewhat friendlier than they are now, and I'm sure the knocker upper wasn't a horrible person, but I'm sure there had to be some grumpy gills who would put their hand on your chest for doing this to them. Number seven, Queen Victoria's eighth child. First of all, eighth, kudos. Here's a fact that we don't talk about enough. Let's do this. First of all, I have no idea what it's like to give birth. I hear the comparisons and what it feels like, whatever, and it makes me want to faint. It's like peeing a watermelon or something like that. It's, I'm gonna faint just talking about it. The fact that you can endure this pain is beyond me. And the fact that you want to as well, kudos. Now imagine being the queen and having the public, like everybody, talk smack about you and how you decide to give birth for the eighth time. Yeah, April 7th, 1853, Queen Victoria decided to use chloroform as an anesthetic delivery. Now everybody at this point, that you know wasn't a scientist, they were sure to voice their opinions on the matter. It was a huge controversy, although this act directly spread the awareness of this medical advancement. I mean, yeah, it sounds, you know, they're like, yeah, don't do that. But can you do that? We don't really know. We're eating bread. Number six, a dog whipper. Looking for someone who absolutely despises dogs and doesn't mind being despised by the rest of us otherwise known as a dog whipper. Back in the day, huntsmen would often hunt foxes and nail their tails to church doors, which would attract dogs of the streets. You'd also have churchgoers who would bring their dogs with them to church. These dogs were not allowed in though, so they'd all have to wait outside. You know how dogs are though. They didn't just sit there waiting patiently. I'm sure some good boys and girls did, but more often than not, they'd be playing and sometimes fighting, disrupting the church services. Enter the dog whipper, who was armed with tongs to grab a dog and remove it from the church grounds, and a whip that would be used on the loudest of the poor pooches. Number five in the countdown is all about buggy dresses. The wealthy Victorians were very into the grandeur, looking to feed a fascination with culture, especially. Beetle wing embroidery was at a peak of fame in the 18th century India, and was quickly appropriated by English visitors while military occupied the country from 1858 to 1947. Elytra, which is the hard casing over a beetle's wing, first appeared on dresses and experienced their first burst of popularity in England by the 1820s, though English women in India had likely been donning it since at least the 1780s. Material used was often white or other pale colors to help augment the reflective green tones of the beetle wing. This visual was made possible when Elytra was paired with Zardozzi, a gold embroidery style often done on colored cottons or silks. Victorians at least didn't appropriate everything about the art form. They made patterns and styles of their own for the dresses. Elytra was sewn onto the gowns in an imitation of live beetle patterns, a reflection of Victorian interest in naturalism and zoology. Not sure why anyone wants to look like they have live bugs crawling on them, but 
Okay. Number four, an upright worker. Upright workers, otherwise known as chimney sweeps, actually started off being children as young as the age of four. The smaller size of the little kiddos was perfect for fitting inside and climbing up and down chimneys. The little suckers would rub their elbows and knees up against the brick of the chimney so much that they would be scraped raw before callousing. Isn't that lovely? No. No, it's not. It's horrible. Some children were deliberately underfed to keep them small enough to do the job. Some of them would get permanent lung damage from the dust and smut and smoke from the chimney. Some kids even got stuck in the chimneys. Thank the Lord they eventually passed a law that would make it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to be a chimney sweep. But even then, Tis not a profession many would like to have. Number three, train engine cleaner. Yeah, this one's gonna suck, it sounds yucky already. For this job, you were required to get into, of course, pretty tough positions to, well, clean the engine of a train. Train engine cleaners would have to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out all that coal that was left over. Yeah, as if shoveling the coal in wasn't bad enough, now some guy's gotta crawl under and shovel it all out. Nope. They go underneath the train with a dusty ash pan and they work away all day long and nights. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains and then spend their nights climbing into the same furnace to clean it out. Every time I watch the Polar Express, it's always so magical, you know, it's always a great time. But even on the Polar Express, there's a guy shoveling coal all night long on Christmas Eve. You know what I mean? That's how bad this job is. Magic can't even save it. Couldn't even picture a worse job to have with this goofy back. Imagine that. Imagine me doing this all day. No way. I'm gonna make it one week. Number two, resurrectionists. Back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of the line. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around, which led to a good price for bodies that were in reasonably good condition other than being deceased. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, as now you've created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves, becoming resurrectionists. A cool name for an absolutely god-awful profession, if you could call it that. The problem was bad enough that people would actually guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. No one should have to do that. Number one, Night Soil Man. All right, if you need me, I'll be depositing my night soil over in the toilet. Poop. Night soil is poop. And the night soilman? Well, you see, before we had real sewer systems, the night soil you deposited at home would go into a lovely hole in the ground. As you can imagine, these would tend to fill up over time, and that's when you have your night soilman come in. Yes. His job was to clear out the poop deposits from houses and cart it away in the middle of the night so nobody in polite society would have to see it. But they were always in business, so that makes the job a little less crappy. Starting our list off at number 10, the first postage stamp. Uh, uh, uh. Nice, who's the first guy who licked the stamp? Why'd he do it, right? We'll start off with stamp facts, why not? I know there's a couple pen pals out there that still use snail mail, that's cool, this one's for you. May 1st, 1840, the world's first ever postage stamp was sold, of course, for one penny. Pretty cheap, nice, we love it. The sale changed history. Now on the stamp was of course a portrait of one Queen Victoria, world's first ever profile photo for a letter. Here we go, they're like, oh, who's this? Who's this little person here? Of course this caught on, definitely caught on. More than 70 million letters were sent within the next year. And then that tripled only a few years later. And of course it thrived for 40 years. Do you still use letters? If so, write into us, write some fan mail. Forget the comments, write into us with a pen with your autograph too, where you live. Yeah, no one's doing that anymore. Number nine, Alexander Graham Bell. I have no idea how phones work. I know it's vibrations and signals and I have to do this occasionally to help it out, but scientifically, nothing. I can't wrap my brain around this technology. Still, I'm 28 years old and I have YouTube, couldn't tell you. If I was sent back in time right now, I wouldn't beat Alexander Graham Bell. I would just watch him and wouldn't change history one bit. Guy's a wizard. On March 7th, 1876, Alexander Graham Bell received a patent on his invention the telephone, and just three days later, he made it work, somehow. The world's first phone call was of course to his assistant, Thomas Watson. Now I'm from the generation that had T9, and I thought that was bad. I also didn't have that, you know, one of these, where you have to like, go around and around a bunch of times. T9 was way worse than anything. You have to Morse code message all your friends. Ugh, we have it too easy today. Never forget about Alexander Graham Bell. Hit that thumbs up on your smartphone for Alexander Graham Bell. How, how does it work? Hello? 
Number eight, Queen Victoria's death. You may have heard the phrase, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Sounds very Westeros, doesn't it? Sounds like the British Empire is in an alternate universe or something, I don't know. But this is meant in a literal sense. On January 22nd, 1901, the Victorian era came to a close, of course, after the death of Queen Victoria herself. She passed away at age 81, and Queen Victoria was succeeded by her oldest son, King Edward VII. Now, at this time, the British Empire literally took up more than one-fifth of all of Earth's land. So the sun actually did not set on the British Empire. It's a real phrase. It's not just a fun bit there. Number seven, a phrenologist. I think if this YouTube thing doesn't work out for me, I'm gonna go and make up a science. It worked for phrenologists. They claimed that a person's personality, character traits, and abilities could all be figured out by bumps and indents on a person's skull. Characteristics like secretiveness, amativeness, conjugality, and combativeness were apparently controlled by areas of the brain that they called organs of the brain. The idea was dismissed by the church, but it nonetheless gained traction through Europe and was really popular in the States. The idea that you could modify these organs through self-control and practice sounded really good to self-help gurus at the time. If only it was real. Number six, grave bells. Oh, this one gives me chills, here we go. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, and anything and everything was spreading. It was not an ideal time, wasn't very safe. Many were biting the bullet at this time, sadly, of course, being gravely ill. But with this came a dark trend, the safety coffin. Yeah, just the backup coffin. These coffins, Lord forbid you are buried alive, these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again. Nice, like it's Michael Jackson's thriller. They would just come up and be like, oh, guess who's back? Back in the Thames, here we go. All these coffins have extra comfort on the inside and a wire. This wire ran through the coffin and then attached to a bell on the outside, on the you know ground floor. So if a passerby or heard it, well, thy would know something's up. Folks would get creative with their safety coffins. I mean, you know, they'd personalize it. Like for example, a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester. He passed in 1791, but instructed his family and watchmen to open this special door that would reveal a layer of glass. So that's real haunting to find. Hey, look like a grandpa. Yeah, he looks good, eh? Patent number 81,437. It was actually granted to France Vester in 1868, and it was an improved burial case. Just a glass case with someone who may or may not be alive inside. 50-50. It had an air inlet, a ladder, and of course, a bell. The description of the patent says, if too weak to ascend by the ladder, they can ring the bell, giving the desired alarm for help, and thus save themselves from premature death by being buried alive. So now I ask you, if you're walking in a graveyard and you heard a bell ringing, what, would you just start digging and be like, ah, I think I heard something, I don't know, let's just disrupt the skeleton. Number five, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing back in the Victorian era, obviously. I mean, they definitely existed. The first lighter was invented in 1823, but it wasn't like the ones we have now, not like those Bix that still don't work. It wasn't a portable thing. The first match was invented in 1805, but it kind of sucked. And the first friction activated match came around much later in 1826. This one here changed the game for good. They were made with white white phosphorus, which is, of course, extremely toxic. But they didn't have machines to make these matches. No, it was, of course, done by people, young women. It was only women that had to do this, and in the worst of conditions, of course. And before you ask, no, they didn't understand protective gear. Well, they did a bit, but even so, women didn't get that kind of luxury, right? They didn't get that treatment. These girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would probably end up ingesting said white phosphorus. The entire shift. History is horrible. Number four. Beauty patches. Okay, we have to bring back beauty patches ASAP. Imagine like if a rapper had a beauty patch. Nelly had the band-aid, but we gotta have like beauty patches. We gotta like, you know, mix it up a bit. Bring back the facial feature game. These patches came in all shapes and sizes, of course, in the Victorian era. Even in this portrait from 1755, Joshua Reynolds painted Charles, the ninth Lord Cathcart, rocking a large beauty patch. That looks amazing. He does look like Nelly, honestly. He has like that motivational, like rapper kind of like, you know, he, He's, he's in charge, and you can tell from the beauty patch. Like, that's a lord right there with that one of those. Take it off, no lord. Put it back on, lord. The reason for these patches back then, and sometimes having more than one, is because they were commonly used to cover up smallpox scars. They were made out of silk, velvet, and they were applied with glue. So pick a spot and commit. It's gonna be there all day. These patches were dark black, and they were meant to make your pale skin pop. Of course, pale skin back then made everyone faint. 
pale, pale skin and long shoes. Everyone's losing their minds. The position of these patches could also determine your political allegiance. How funny is that? Historian Joseph Addison took note of these positions when he observed two parties from the 1800s. Now, one party had patches on the right side and the other had the opposite. It's pretty, pretty amazing. It's a pretty easy way to flip jerseys, right? The other team starts winning. You're like, you know what? Check it out. Now I'm on this side. Prove it. Number three in the countdown is bird-brained. I enjoy my puns, but there's a reason for that one. This trend was started by the notorious Marie Antoinette, a rebel in the French courts for her outlandish fashion and accessories. Amongst her pile of powdered curls, Marie was often seen with feathered caps and bonnets. While this look became an envy for women across America and Europe, the trend did struggle to take off initially as much of the aristocracy was perturbed by it. However, a trend is a trend, and eventually the English society was persuaded. They donned mainly ostrich, pheasant, or peacock feathers at first, eventually entire songbirds were stuffed after their death and adorned these hats. By the late 1800s, the plume trade had decimated several species of birds, including flamingos, birds of paradise, and rosy spoonbirds. Topping the endangered list were the snowy and great egrets, as at one point their pure white feathers were worth more than gold. Promoters of the feather trade knew what they were doing and also knew that the public didn't understand the carnage that their fashion was seeing on these animals. They held that wearing feathers and whole birds brought city dwellers closer to nature, that it improved people's awareness and knowledge of bird species. Thankfully, it's due to the inevitable public awareness and then disapproval that bird hat sales diminished and went out of trend altogether. Number two, Jack the Ripper. Unidentified to this day. Who is he? How did he get away with it? And also, when are we gonna see a Netflix documentary on this guy? We have everybody else in this multiverse of killers. Where's this guy? Gonna complete the image. Well, because we didn't find him. Jack the Ripper was active in the East London neighborhoods, primarily, and sadly, he would target sex workers at the time. He famously took the lives of five women from August to November of 1888, and they were believed to have been connected to Jack the Ripper, although some sources claim that he was active until 1891. It's hard to tell who's who and who's doing what. Again, this is also so long ago. There's no cameras. Hard to catch someone. Many believe Jack the Ripper had some anatomical knowledge due to the way that he left his victim as well, which is creepy. While there were some suspects, including a member of the British royal family, believe it or not, Jack the Ripper was never identified, so. Yeah, that sucks, really. We gotta find him. Can't, but we gotta. And finally, number one, mudlarks. Yeah, we'll get dirty for this last one here, why not? Victorian London around the 1840s, it was a bit of a mess. Everyone was sick, a lot of sore throats, to say the least. The jobs that were available, they sucked. They certainly didn't help you, you know, survive. The jobs that were available had you catching rats and crawling into sewers. One of the worst jobs to have was that of a mud lark. Now, as the name hints towards, a mud lark involved getting in deep in the mud and muck that would build up alongside the Thames River. Yeah, that dirty river back then. They're like, yeah, just go through the, the lining of that. See what's in there. Ugh. This one was reserved, again, for the younger folk with, you know, the, uh, the, the patellas that still worked, you know, digging in the mud, of course. Can't have an old guy in there. He's not gonna come back out. It was like working in quicksand. It was horrible. It was exhausting. Not to mention the chances of being whisked away by the river at any given moment. Yeah, it sucked. All for the slim chance of finding a pocket watch or some driftwood, rags, something, anything really worth your troubles. Getting us started at number 10 is top hats. A top hat is an iconic image. You can see them in old black and white movies or on logos such as Mr. Peanut. But why were top hats created? And why were they so trendy? Well, there's multiple reasons actually. Men and women were already wearing hats and bonnets to protect their heads from rain, wind, and the soot from local smokestacks. As a result, hats were already quite a trendy wear. However, the true reason for its popularity is what it represented. The top hat quickly became symbolic of status, power, and masculinity. From 1850 to 1900, men wore top hats for business, pleasure, and formal occasions. Certain colors were even associated with certain times of day. For example, a black top hat was for day or night, making its wear feel taller, more handsome, even suave. Some were even reported to be a height of 12 to 14 inches tall. Top hats, amongst other hats of this era, also required ridiculous upkeep, such as being brushed, boiled regularly, powdered, etc. They also tend to contain mercury poison. As time progressed, we found other ways to overcompensate as well as accessorize our heads, so it's easier to see why the top hat never made a comeback. 
back. Number nine in the countdown is women and their flirty fans. When you see a gentleman caller across the room, you may want to send him a hint that you're picking up the vibe that his top hat is putting out. What better way than sublimial messaging with an item you're already carrying? In Victorian times, women carried fans due to fainting spells, which were really just the result of their excessively tight and heavy garments, something we'll cover later in the video. In 1827, a fan maker from Paris, Double Roy, published a leaflet explaining the language behind the uses of a fan. Some examples were twirling the fan in the right hand meant that I love another. Meanwhile, drawing the fan across the cheek told someone special that I love you. A fan half opened and pressed to the lips gave permission for a kiss. However, it is rumored that the less romantic truth is that the fan etiquette, such as Duval Roy's leaflet, was invented in order to boost the sales of fans in the 19th century after they had fallen out of fashion following the French Revolution. Irregardless of rumors, it appears in olden times some people were using fans to get hot rather than cool down. Speaking of keeping it cool, next in our countdown at number eight is bottomless underwear. While showing a bit of ankle may have made you a harlot, in the Victorian era, every woman was walking around with crotchless undergarments. But these strange underoos were invented with a justified purpose. Due to the amount of fabric layers, steel crinolines, and tight bodices and dresses, women of the era didn't really have time to spend an hour undressing before nature calls. By creating undergarments that had holes aligned with the wearer's groin, a woman's only mission would be to hoist up as many layers as she could before popping a squat. Don't be fooled however, that wasn't exactly easy either. Some of you may wonder, what happened if Aunt Flo paid a visit while a woman was wearing an open bottom undergarment? Well, in Victorian times, menstruation hygiene was perceived very different and women quite literally let it flow. If you want to learn more, search that one up on your own. As fashion evolved and women wore fewer and lighter clothes in the early 20th century, pulling down undergarments from underneath bustles and cages was no longer a nightmare, so the crotchless undergarment was soon abandoned once more. But now it does make sense why everyone loved the high kicking can can dancers in 19th century Paris. Number seven. Grave designs. Graves, but make them cool, you know? Customize your own pit in the ground. That's fun, that's grim. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, pretty much anything floating around your mouth and eyes, it was spreading and it was bad. Not a good thing to ingest. Not an ideal time in history. Many were biting the bullet at this time, of course, being gravely ill. But with this came a dark new fun trend. Yeah, here we go. The safety coffin. Yeah, let's uh, make your own coffin, DIY. These coffins, God forbid, you were buried alive while these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again. Yeah, some Tony Stark guy in the back's like, if you push this, the body will pop back out and come to life. It's like, really? A lot of these coffins were built with extra comfort on the inside and of course, a wire, the safety backup wire. This wire ran through the coffin, through the ground, and attached to a bell on the outside on the ground. So if somebody was walking by and they heard a bell ringing beside a gravestone, first of all, it's haunting, well, they know that something's up and they can get them out. But folks would get creative with their safety coffins. They would ask the inventor to make them crazy things, like a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester. He had some odd requests. He passed away in 1791, but he instructed his family and watchmen to open the special door on his coffin after he passed. The special door would reveal a layer of glass. Yeah, so if anybody saw any condensation, well, you know, he's still alive and get him out. Only he wasn't alive. And now we just have the world's scariest exhibit. Just a real life dead man. Let's close that back up forever. I don't want a glass coffin, that's disgusting. Number six in our countdown is the human hair wearers. Fun because it rhymes, but creepy for a whole slew of reasons. So what do I mean by human hair wearers? Well, it was a tradition in Victorian era to don jewelry that had segments of human hair embossed, woven, or sealed into it. But for many Victorian people, People, the amount of hair involved in remembering loved ones went far beyond a little lock in a necklace. In stores and women's magazines, you could find patterns for wreaths made of hair and wire, often floral designs. Bracelets, brooches, earrings, and necklaces were also all very common. In its prime, human hair, jewelry, and decor was considered incredibly fashionable. It's even said that swapping locks of hair was a love token between women loving women or friends, the way that girls today might wear friendship bracelets with each other. I guess if you need a trim and you were already late on a birthday gift, you could really just kill two birds with one stone. Number five, 
a rat catcher. I know this will make a few of you out there squirm in your seats. Rats in Victorian England were a massive problem. They were everywhere. Every nook and cranny of your house, from the basement to the pipes. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So of course, where there is a problem, there is a job. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era and were highly praised in society, but the job wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into the dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and catching and often killing thousands of rats a year. Often rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats too. I don't know though. Gonna be me. Number four is the casual ball gown. One of the most notable shifts in Victorian time was that fashion began to be differentiated by gender rather than class. This reflected the changing roles of women in society. And let me say, every part of Victorian women's fashion seems tortuous. You start your day layering on long, crotchless underwear and tunics before strapping a metal cage to your waist. You'd then wear an average of six skirts over that, alongside bodices and corsets that would forever change the placement of your organs and potentially even suffocate you to death. The reported average weight of a Victorian dress when fully on could be anywhere between 14 and 22 pounds. But the risk doesn't end there. In fact, it was everywhere. It was estimated that between the 1850s and 1860s, 3,000 women in England died from their crinolines catching fire, as airy fabrics and hoop-supported skirts also allowed for plenty of air to circulate beneath a dress, which could also make a small flame grow out of control in seconds. In 18 64, the New York Times reported that 40,000 women worldwide perished from dress related fires. Another common occurrence was to see them pulled into machinery after walking too close and having some of the skirts catch in exposed parts. Yikes. It's no wonder that the large ball gown crinolines phased out in the late 1800s, but then bustles came in and they were worse in different ways. While more practical as it was slim on the sides and the front, it required women to sacrifice movement and comfort in order to achieve a fashionable shape like the course it did. They began to alter women's spines, ribs, and organs over time as they required women to twist their bodies completely in order to be able to sit down. Overall, while movies and TV may make these beautiful gowns seem whimsical and ethereal, they truly were just death traps. Number three, chimney sweep. Ah, terrible jobs. Here we go. I remember when I was younger, I had to sweep the chimney in the house and I loved it. I thought it was cool. I thought it was like a little safety, like secret room. I don't know. It wasn't safe at all, actually. It was just a dirty room. I had a little broom too. I always loved using that little broom. Little tiny sweeps, one at a time. Little tiny bag to go along with it. So gentle. This was a terrible job to have in Victorian London, obviously. Chimney sweeps were famously young as well. I can't say anything else there, but these guys were young lads. History is horrible. Maybe that's why I was doing it, right? Because I could fit inside of the thing. That makes sense. 1840 was a good year, all things considered. A law was passed that made it illegal for anybody under the age of 21 to climb in and clean a chimney. I was 18 cleaning my chimney. I had no idea. I could have used this great law and got out of the whole chore. Shame. Number two slot in the countdown is Paris Green. It seemed Parisian aristocracy had a chokehold on the globe with their trends. It's believed Empress Eugenie was to have worn a dress so stunning at the Paris Opera one evening in 1864 that it was featured in newspapers globally the next day. It was a deep yet vibrant green, one rumored to almost glow in darkness. The green of Paris quickly became the hue of the social elite. So how was Paris green made and why was it so dangerous? The color was discovered when chemists combined copper and arsenic poison. The result was a dye brighter than all the other greens available on the market. Copper wasn't what gave this color its iconic nickname, however. Arsenic is a highly hazardous substance that causes skin sores, vomiting, diarrhea, and in some circumstances, cancers or death, as we know now. But they didn't. When factory workers' arms and hands began to wilt away from sores and decay that could only be connected to the dye, French and German governments enacted legislation prohibiting the production of arsenic-based pigments. It's the right thing to do. Meanwhile, the British government mainly ignored them. Even when Matilda Schreuer famously died of arsenic poisoning with the whites of her eyes stained green from her working in factories, this was deemed accidental poisoning by the government at the time. Paris green remained popular in England until ironically it just went out of trend. It's a little bit of an abrupt ending honestly. No justice for those exposed in workplaces or compensation for suffering. But nothing takes the cake quite like the Victorian trend of looking dead, which is number one in our countdown. You'd figure people look dead enough as is inhaling arsenic and mercury from their clothes and shoes and hats constantly, let alone their home decor. But looking dead was the fashion of the day. This look 
Luke was specifically modeled after how tuberculosis affected you. Pale skin, watery eyes, red lips. While this disease was decimating the lower status, higher status women recreated it with makeup and arsenic consumption. You heard me right. In order to get pale skin, women consumed arsenic. In order to not die from arsenic, the consumer had to follow a careful process, eating small doses to build up a tolerance. Now, arsenic is addictive, so if they at any point stopped the consumption, they would experience withdrawals such as vomiting, stomach pains, convulsions, hair loss, nervous system failure, kidney failure, delusions, the list goes on. Some women were stuck taking it for the rest of their lives. For the desired watery eye look, women would put citrus or even perfume in their eyes. Some went farther, using belladonna flower, also known as deadly nightshade, for longer lasting tears. However being poisonous, little wonder why blindness was a widely reported as a symptom of belladonna drops. No wonder it did such a good job. Red lip paint included? You guessed it, more poison. In this case, usually lead. All of these poisonous products would contribute to illnesses and facial decay. Death was of course a long term side effect of the usage once poisoning reached its crescendo. Suffice to say, while you may really want to fit in, some trends are not worth getting on board for, especially if they'll slowly melt your face off. Number 10, knocker upper. All right, sounds a little different than its actual purpose. Hear me out. Alarm clocks, they're not great, right? They suck, no doubt about it. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real life person. What does that look like? What does that sound like, rather? That's 6 a.m. That person is called a knocker upper, a person employed solely to wake up workers at mills and factories on those early morning shifts. Now, going from house to house using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows, that sounds like the best job ever, right? I can't close the list with this one. This is number 10, for sure. It's kind of fun. If you had this job, well, you're probably not alive anymore. I don't know, unless you live in a weird town. The people at the time were a lot friendlier back then than they are now, so you know, I'm sure the knocker upper came around today, be a little different. They'd probably be on World Star the next day. Knocker upper is back in the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for waking me up. I would have lost $14. Thank you. It was a big deal. It was definitely a big deal. Number nine. The Linkerman. Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, if you were traveling alone at night, well, you probably get lost. Because, yeah, even London now would get lost, you know what I mean? So that's where a Linkerman would ideally come into play. They'd come in to save your night. What they would do is they would carry with them a torch to help guide your way home. They'd be like, hey, follow me, I know these streets, and then you'd do it, I guess. It's a little scary. At the end of this impromptu tour, they'd of course expect a little tip from you. Of course, of course, thank you for lighting my path and getting me home, cheers. Here's one nickel, it's actually a lot back then. Here's one penny, there we go. They weren't so bad, they were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to B, whilst also being able to see one foot in front of the other, that doesn't hurt, especially in Victorian London. You gotta step on a dirty rat, that'll be gross. It's like a friend walking you home, only you don't know them, and it's the Victorian era, so probably pretty unsafe. 50-50 if you're gonna make it. And their charge was usually one farthing or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker man, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from that era. And there were even a couple famous linker men, famous linker mans, like Lawrence Casey, for example, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Imagine that, your arm must be so strong with that lamp all day. Ooh, it's just like, oh, I can't put it down. Number eight, ghost photography. 1800s ghost photography. Apparently it was a theme or a, a vibe, I don't know, but there are people that would take the photos of these ghosts. So at one point you would be hired as a professional ghost photographer. On paper, here's your tax returns, that's what I did. The camera of course was a hot new invention back then, so tales of ghosts and spirit were easily believed. Especially when you have a photo of a see-through woman. That probably helps sell your tail for sure. Like, up oh, here she is. It's like that's that's mom. That's definitely not. You just did that in the back room. That's I don't believe you. A big name in the ghost game was that of William Thomas Stead. He was born in 1849, so now he's for sure a ghost. Stead was the son of a Congregationalist minister, and at the age of 22, he was appointed as editor of the Northern Echo, which was a regional newspaper in Darlington. Yeah, this British medium Richard Borsonal featured a photo of W. T. Stead and a spirit. Imagine that, imagine a day where somebody was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and they also posed for photo ops with ghosts. Like, can we pick a lane, science or not? What are we doing here? Morning garb, and I don't mean pajamas, is number seven in our countdown. Known as the monarch of mourning, Queen Victoria influenced how grieving women dressed and behaved in Europe and the United States after the passing of her husband in 1861. She famously mourned him for 40 years until her own demise and started what's now known as the Victorian mourning etiquette. Victorian mourning etiquette came with elaborate rituals to commemorate their dead. It became normal to have incredible 
incredibly elaborate and lavish funerals, curtail social behavior, and even erect statues and ornate monuments as tombstones. Mourning clothes were part of this and they were introduced for both sexes. Set to show a family's outward display of their inner feelings after the passing of a loved one, the rules for who wore what and for how long were complicated and often outlined in popular journals or household manuals. Call that a mourner's magazine. Jokes aside, men definitely had it a lot easier. They simply wore their usual dark suits along with black gloves, hat bands, cravats or ties. For women, especially should she be a widow, there were different levels of mourning and garb to wear as you progressed out of deep mourning and into lighter mourning and so forth. Deep mourning uh, was of course black, but also made specifically was a crepe styling, a scratchy silk with a puffed crimped appearance associated with mourning as it doesn't pair with any other clothing. Right. The mourner would eventually stop donning the crepe and then stop donning black. This was called slightening the mourning before cloth colors eventually moved on to gray, mauve, then white until the mourning period was considered complete. Number six, rat catcher. I mean, obviously, you know what's going to happen with the name the rat catcher. It's going to make a lot of you out there squirm in your seats, and I apologize in advance. Hit that thumbs up, you know, let's even out the energy. Rats in Victorian England. They were a massive problem. They were everywhere. Every nook and cranny of your home probably had a dirty, fat rat just sitting there with its weird teeth looking at you. From the basement to the pipes, everywhere. It was literally a, it was a big problem. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So imagine that. So of course, there's a problem. So of course, where there's a problem, there's now a job, right? Someone's got to do something about it. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era. I mean, of course, brave souls. And they were highly praised in society, but the job, obviously, wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and we'd catch them and you'd often have to kill thousands of rats every single year. And then deal with that. I don't even know how you deal with those bodies. Let's say bones, ew. More often than not, rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats, so. You have your own little animal posse hunting down other animals. You would feel pretty good. You'd feel like a, the king of animals almost. Probably not, eh? It's probably a disgusting job. You probably hate it every day. Number five, gym day. Believe it or not, they were around 200 gyms all across Europe during Victorian times. Dudes were getting shredded. Why not? They're like, hey, we don't have dinner, but might as well just work out. These gyms weren't bright. They weren't open. They weren't well ventilated, motivating, safe. None of those things that you need today. No, Victorian gyms were reserved for the upper class. Uh, yes, of course. Grab your pocket watch and your blazer, Ezekiel. We're doing some bench pressing today, I guess. Yeah, grab your monocle for sure. You're going to need that. These machines also, they were not ideal to work out. They were designed as antiques first, rather than, you know, their fitness purpose and safety purpose also. Like, half these look like saw traps. There's no way I'm gonna be bending my arm around any of these Victorian devices. Even the machines today at the gym, I'm like, no way, no thank you. Weak gang, here we go. Number four. Resurrectionalist. All right, back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of their line, right? You're not gonna go dig up someone's wife and be like, hey, mind if I study her? He's like, no, please. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around to begin with, which led to a good price for bodies that were in, well, reasonably good condition to, you know, study up close, other than being, you know, deceased and disgusting. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, sure, I'll admit that. Now you've probably created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves. And that's exactly what happened. People would become their own resurrectionalist. It's a cool name for a god-awful profession if you want to call it that. The problem was so bad that people had to protect, like they had to guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. Or else these guys would come in and try and dig them up and sell your Nana for like 20 bucks. You have to stay there for four nights and guard her. That's great. No one should have to do that. The Victorian era sucked. No one should have to do that or this next one here. Number three, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing in the Victorian era. They definitely existed, as the first one was invented in 1823, but it was not exactly a portable thing. So matches were your match. The first match was invented in 1805, but it sucked. The first friction activated match came about in 1826, and they were made with white phosphorus, which is extremely toxic. But they didn't have machines to make these matches. Nah, it was actually mainly done by teenage girls. And in the worst of conditions too. Forget protective gear. Oh, you wanna take your lunch break away from the highly toxic white phosphorus? Oh, no, no, no. That's right. These girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would end up ingesting the white phosphorus. Mmm, yes, my favorite seasoning. Number two, funeral mute. Ah, uh, yes. 
death. Happened quite a lot back then. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, you know? Don't drop them, hmm? All that kind of stuff. Victorian London saw many, many funeral mutes. Now, Oliver Twist, one of the lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. Oliver Twist is like, this one sucks, this one really sucks. Mutes were required to dress, of course, in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would be to, well, to stand and mourn and not say a thing the entire time. You'd have to stand at the door of the recently deceased home and just welcome death. Just embrace it, you have to be death. The mascot for death is now you. Horrible. In Victoria, London too, you're gonna breathe in a fresh rotting body. Nice, that's good. I have about four days left, thank you. And after that point, you would lead the coffin all the way to the graveyard, nice and slow, like you were uh, leading a marching band. Only it's not music, it's death behind you. And finally, number one, a chimney sweep. I remember doing this when I was a kid. Okay, I got some questions now. I'm gonna make some phone calls after this list. I had to do this when I was a kid, but back then it was a lot worse. It wasn't a chore, it was an actual job. This was a terrible job to have in Victorian London, obviously. Chimney sweeps were famously young men. Guys, I can't say anything else here, but they were young lads. That's it. History is pretty horrible, right? You could fill it in. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because a law was passed that made it officially illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and clean a chimney. Nice, I was 18 cleaning my chimney at home. I had no idea, I could have busted out this law and been like, actually, three more years, dad. See ya, just moonwalk out of there. I'm not cleaning anything, just the kitchen for now. I'm not using that tiny little brush. Why do all chimney sweeps have a tiny brush? Give them a bigger brush, you know?